So I am very excited to welcome our speaker today, um, Dr. Therese Wolfen. She is the director of the Assistive Technology Act for New Hampshire, but she hails from our state. And she emailed earlier this year and said that she was going to be in town for a family reunion. And so we thought, hey, let's make it worth her while coming all the way here. And we busted out actually perfect weather for her today versus yesterday. Um, so I will let her share a little bit more about her. Um, her whole her bio is in the folder, um, but she is full of energy and will keep you engaged all day. And the creative creative ideas you're going to leave with today are going to um, really carry forward into the work that you do. So welcome, Therese. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be back in Wisconsin. Everything is so green. I love June. And it usually is a little bit warmer by now, but it's been a, a bit chilly. But that's OK. The heat and the humidity will be here soon enough. So I am just thrilled to talk about this whole thing about maker's movement. And um, we'll also talk about um, a little bit later about liability. People are like, well, what about making stuff? About um, what are th the dangers about making stuff? But I just really want to focus on the whole thing about making and why making is important and what happens to your brain in terms of making. But just a little bit of background of who I am. Uh, I grew up in southeastern Wisconsin, a little town called Salem, uh, down in Kenosha County. Anybody know where that's at? Oh my gosh, we're at Central or Salem Grade or which one? Holy cow, that is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I know, a lot of people don't know Salem, yeah. So being one of 10 kids, and I remember just loving the dairy farm, and I remember you know, picking up milk with my dad, and I remember taking care of the land, the animals, and all of us kids working together for this common goal of farming. And we were all valued on the farm, and I loved the smell of dirt, and the smell of hay, and milking cows. And, and then we talk about you don't have a disability until somebody says you have a disability. So what happened was going to um, Salem grade school, there we go, um, that whole thing about um, difficulty, the part with reading and writing. And they said, you know, she can't read and write, and she makes these weird noises. And um, so. I was diagnosed, three of us, two of my brothers and myself, with dyslexia. And then I was the only one in the family with Tourette syndrome and making all these noises. And I remember my dad telling me to sit on my hands. And back then, the drug of choice was Haldol. And it was like a frontal lobotomy. It was like the lights were on in nobody's home. Back then, we now know it's a neurological disorder that affects the basal ganglia of the brain. But back then, they thought it was a psychiatric disorder. And even today, I don't like, you know, they'll say neurobehavioral or behavioral. And that word, anytime you put that word behavior, the only time you hear of good behavior is getting let out of prison for good behavior. Other than that, behavior in terms of all, all being bad. Well, now there's this new term about neurodiversity. And I was like, wow, that is really cool. It's about thinking about the, the world differently. And you're going to see a lot today about what if you turn everything upside down, inside out, and backwards, right? And the other part about having Tourette syndrome was the way to be completely focused was to always have something in my hands. So when I was little, there was little ball and jacks, right? And so those little red balls. And I became really good with those little red balls. I could do all sorts of cool things. Then I got into juggling and basketball. To this day, I still hold the record in Kenosha County for the most number of points ever scored in one basketball game. Um, <laughs> my claim to fame, right? <laughs> Because of the accession, because when I was completely focused on bouncing the ball, um, I could have that control. Then I remember when I was 10 years old, my dad brought home a pool table. And pool table has lots of balls. So I became a pool shark. 
And my dad would bring home his drinking buddies, and he'd say, my 10-year-old can beat all of you. And he'd put the money on the table. And he was my pimp, right? <laughs> made, made a ton of money. Yeah. <laughs> now, in special education, you know, when you make a lot of noises and you can't read and write, they have what's called the BD classroom, the behavioral disorder classroom. Um, and a lot of interesting characters in that classroom and being mainstreamed into the regular ed classroom um, probably in the, in the 70s, in my um, sixth grade, seventh, eighth grade, and they had a reading resource teacher, and she was a lovely lady who was trying to get me to read from left to right instead of right to left. And in a country school, people pretty much get used to you making all those noises, right? It's like, oh, yeah, she's done that since, I don't know, first grade. Nobody's, no big deal. And then in high school, it was, yeah, you know, she can't really read or write, but that's all right because she's a hard worker and Quaker Industries across the border into, uh, we were, lived real cl close to the border. They were hiring at the factory. And I remember taking the entrance exams, you know, college stuff, and it was always in the bottom two percentile. And this whole thing about low expectations. And so I was working also as a waitress at the Colony House, and, uh, and I remember turning point. And the turning point was this, was I was putting gas in my car um, one day, and at Central High School, there was a teacher by the name of Mrs. Larson. She was an English teacher. Well, English was my worst subject because you've got to read and write in English. And everything would always get marked up in red. And I remember my mom wanted all of us girls to get a high school diploma. She wanted all the, all the kids to get high school diplomas, but she specifically wanted the girls. And I said, why not the boys? Why shouldn't they get a high school diploma? Ah, they don't need a high school diploma on the farm. You no, know, but if they get it, that's fine. But you girls, you can't survive unless you have a high school diploma. And so a couple of my brothers, they dropped out of school, eventually went back, got their GED. And I remember Mrs. Larson, I said, oh, I just, if I could get a D in your course, you know, I, I could get this high school diploma. And she said, why would you strive for a D? And I said, well, this is my worst subject because you're just going to mark everything up in red. And so she said, um, how about I just want you to write every day. I won't mark anything up. And so, <laughs> so um, I ended up getting an A in English, which was amazing because it was all my report cards was always C, D, um, yeah, a bunch of C's, D, every now and then maybe a B. I love science. But I remember bringing the report card home and it said English, A. And my mom said, how is that possible? You always get a D. And I said, because Mrs. Larson said she wouldn't take any points off for misspelled words. And she'd say, what kind of a teacher is that? Right? <laughs> but she put me on the student newspaper. And so what are you going to write about? She goes, I don't know. You're going to figure out something. So my obsession, so the, the part about to be able to control myself in the classroom was keeping my hands under the table. Because the minute my hands came outside the table, I was hitting, I was having all of these mo movements. Well, in schools, cafeterias, desks, everything, what is underneath every table, every desk? Gum. Gum. Yes, bubble gum. And I became obsessed with all this gum under the table. It was all different colors and sizes and shapes. And I had to turn them over and that obsession. So I wrote an article about a sticky situation at Salem Central High School, right, about gum. And I didn't tell my mother that I wrote this article. Anyways, it won this national award. It was being read out loud on WLS radio out of Chicago. We're sitting eating our cornflakes, right, for breakfast. And on the radio, they say, we have from, from Salem, Wisconsin, Therese Wilkham, author of It's a Sticky Situation at Central High. And he proceeds to read this article about 101 things you could do with this bubble gum underneath the table. And my mother was, she stopped with her coffee, and she looked at me and was like, is that you? I went, yeah, that is the grossest story I've ever <laughs> So it was like, oh my gosh. So here I am, you know, about a year later, whatever, milking cows, working at the colony house, putting TV trays. 
And Mrs. Larson's getting gas, and she says, Therese, what are you doing? I told her my three jobs. She said, you're smart. You can go to college. I go, oh, no. You, you, you got to be able to read and write. And you know I make all those mo mo motions and everything. I, could, I can't read and write. And she said, no, you know, I went to one of these professional development workshops, and they have services for students with disabilities in college. And I said, well, like what? She said, you know, you can get all your books on tape. You could take all your tests orally. Um, they've got uh, maybe a scanning thing. They've got special note-taking paper. And I was like, wow. She said, I'll tell you what, how about after work tonight, um, I'm going to come over to the farm, and uh, I'm going to talk to your mom and dad. And I'm like, okay, well, all right. So get down milking cows. My dad comes in from the barn, and all of a sudden, down up the road, whatever, Mrs. Lars, I forgot to tell my mom. Now, we were a hard-working family, not that we were the cleanliest family, but you know um, fly paper? You know that stuff? We'd have that over the chandelier, right, for the flies to, you know, I'm like pulling that down. I go, Mom, Mrs. Larson, she wants to meet with you and Dad. And, and I'm carving off a spot on the dining room table, you know, for her to sit. And she, she comes in, and my parents believed that teachers were God, right? They were like, wow. And so Mrs. Larson and my dad said, you know, and so uh, sat down. I said, oh, Mr. Larson wants to talk. And so we're, they're around the table, and I'm just really embarrassed. And uh, Mrs. Larson proceeds to say, your daughter is smart, and I really think she can go to college. And my mom went, she's a good kid. She's got a high school diploma. She's working these three jobs. She's a hard worker. She'll never have a problem getting a job. She don't have to go to college. She's got three jobs, you know. And, and I just wanted to crawl underneath the table going, oh, God, this is awful, this is awful. And see, neither one of my parents had a high school diploma. Education was not valued. So then he turns to my dad, look, what do you think? And my dad's got his hand in the bubble overall. Well, she's 19 years old. She can do whatever she wants to do. She can go to college. She can go to college. Ooh. She's going to have to pay for it. And I was like, wow. And so whatever my father said, you know, that went. My father ruled in terms of the house. So Mrs. Larson fought for me to get into the University of Wisconsin Stout. She went to disability support services with me and helped me to get every book on tape, take every test orally, and projects. So writing papers was really difficult. And so what I would do is I would do alternative projects for versus papers. I would do audiovisual presentations and movies and slideshows and all of this stuff um, at Stout. And I ended up graduating summa cum laude. I ended up getting straight A's. And that was my introduction to assistive technology because I finally had all of the items, all the things that I needed. And you know my obsession with bubble gum and my obsession with paper clips and my obsession with balls. Today, you are going to be making things out of paper clips, right? Who never who would think that my obsession with paper clips would someday pay off? Because no, no, no gum. <laughs> <laughs> Darn, I know, but something really close. We're gonna make, uh, gonna show you some boogers, right? We got some really cool boogers that we can make. So, um, yeah, that that all of those things that our weaknesses really become our strengths. That we use that all in different ways and about seeing the world differently and exploring things differently. I went on to get my master's. Oh, and the other thing that happened at Stout was I was sitting in this lecture, and this man got up, and he was talking about, at that time, it was rehabilitation engineering. It was before the word assistive was coined. Never, assistive never existed in the Webster Dictionary prior to 1988. It was 1988 Technology Related Assistance Act that assistive finally was born, that word, instead of rehab engineering. And this guy was talking about taking garage door openers. And he was from Madison, and then, um, he, then, then there was this other guy talking about going to an art store and getting supplies and building all of these things. And I was like, that's what I want to do. Because I remember growing up at the farm, my dad had an amazing machine shop. 
he could weld. And actually, I learned how to do welding when I was 10 years old. And at Stout, I took a welding course. And I took a light building instruction course and a material science courses. And I loved, loved, loved building and modifying. And I remember my cousin getting his arm caught in a corn picker accident. And I remember my dad saying, we got to get over there. We're going to have to modify his tractor because he's, he's got these kids to feed. He's got to get back, you know, farming again. And so I was like, wow, that is like really something watching my dad. So I ended up getting my master's degree. So this guy that came to South talking about rehab engineering, I go, that's what I want to do. And he said, I'll tell you what, if you come to Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, I'll let you do all your field work in assistive technology. So there were four rehab engineers, and one was from Milwaukee, Ed Ellingson, worked at Curative Rehab, and went to meet with Ed. And Ed loved to do everything out of plywood and a hot glue gun and some vinyl. And he'd be building all these wheelchair seating stuff. He was really cool. Another guy was an aircraft mechanic. Loved to do everything out of aluminum, right? And then Carrie Jones from Indianapolis loved nylon. He says, nylon cuts like butter. And so when you meet with all these people, and then you start exploring yourself. You start looking at other materials. You start looking at um, things that you didn't grow up with on the farm. And I remember coming back to the farm with all this stuff and saying to Dad, Dad, you don't need angle iron to do this. Look what I can do with corner guard that you can get in the wallpaper department. You know, and then I'd say, we don't have to weld this. Guess what? 3M has new adhesives that are strong as rivets and glue, Dad. It's much faster, you know? And then I said, PVC pipe, Dad. Look what I can do. We don't you need round bar stock, you know? He was doing everything, raw, chop, chop, right? So I discovered my own materials. And today, the materials that you're going to be exposed to and use, I want you to think about selecting materials that are reusable, repurposable, non-toxic, biodegradable. So we're going to be talking about all of that. And as I start talking about these wicked cool materials, you're going to say, oh, where do you get that? Where do you get that? It's in your handout. And you can take your phone. If you have an iPhone, you just scan it with your phone. And that it goes right to a YouTube clip or right to the website as to where you can buy it. OK? And then if um, you don't have an iPhone and you have um, a Samsung Android, you can download the QR code scanning app for free too and scan that. So it'll take you right to whether it's a video or whether it's the website that you can go to to find out to order those different um, items. So, oh, so Mrs. Larson, so my daughter gives me a hard time. So I, I something happened was. So Laura, you know, you were talking about when you're on the spot, you're in a situation, how do you quickly think on your feet? And, and what if you had, you know, the basic tools and materials with you, right? And you carry it with you, what could you do, right? And so one day, I have, you know, those crates you get at Staples. And there was this particular school that was really struggling. They had eight kids that needed all these AT solutions. And I remember rolling the stuff in. And that day, I made 32 different devices. And the school said, wow, um, wow, that, that was so easy. Well, we could do that, you know, if we had that. And so then the Gibney family came in um, to my office and said, and this very rarely happens where somebody sits down at a conference table with you and they open up their briefcase and they pull out a white sheet of paper and they slide it in front of you and there's nothing on it. And they said, inspire us. And I said, ah, oh, OK. Um, and then they said, we have all these grandchildren. And our father passed away. And he was blind. And he had wanted to give money back in terms of helping individuals with disabilities. What would you do? And I think about this school. How can I empower people? How can I empower people to be quick problem solvers? How can I make MacGyver kits up type of thing? And what about things you can't make, right? Like an iPad. I can't fabricate an iPad and all those different apps. So I went back to the Gibney family and I said, um, if you give the money, right, what we'll do is we'll do this book and 
100%, so I don't get one cent from it, but 100% of all the how-to projects all goes into a restricted account to pay for electronic devices that I can't build. Except I'm starting to get better at that. I learned about Arduinos and Raspberry Pi and Strawberry Pi, but Strawberry Pi you eat. But anyways, <laughs> so so then I put you know a DVD with all these videos of how to in the book, and so it was a great fundraiser. The other part is every state has a waiver, and the waiver programs for the Medicaid waiver. But you have to come up with a state match, right? And so the state's like, we're not going to give you any more money. So we use the sales of the book for the state match to then, after we bought the devices, we did the value of the devices, we used that as a state match so that we could bill Medicaid for loans of assistive technology devices. So it was a really cool, innovative way. Well, now, guess what? Nobody has. DVD drives in their computers, right? But QR codes, so I have a QR code sheet now that goes with it so that um, in case you don't have a DVD drive. But the other cool thing about this when we talk about neurodiversity is the book, this was never written at all on a computer. Mm -mm. And it was never typed, no. So it doesn't exist on a computer, it was never typed never written. The way it was done was on an iPad with the microphone. I would take a picture and then I'd hit the built-in microphone and I would dictate it. And Pages is an app that has a recipe template. So you know how recipes have ingredients, so I just put tools and materials. And I just dictated everything, just using my voice. And then you could save it as a PDF and export it to the printer in Manchester. So never once did it ever touch my computer. So I share that story about thinking outside the box, about writing doesn't always have to be a pen and paper. It doesn't have to be a computer. And the goal is, and when we go back to Wisconsin and Mrs. Larson, the part about looking at alternative ways that people can demonstrate that they know the information or to share the information. Now, Oh, and then I ended up going back, getting my PhD in Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the University of Pittsburgh. And I've been in New Hampshire now for 20 years. And we have a graduate certificate program in assistive technology that I oversee. So it's an online hybrid, which does intense um, hands-on kinds of activities, plus the lecture stuff is all online. And then I teach in the occupational therapy department. I teach a couple of assistive technology courses, and then I'm a half-time appointment with the Institute on Disability where I'm the director of New Hampshire State Tech Act program. So I, I do a lot of stuff. But I have to tell you what happened this week. So this week was really awesome because um, I went to the Museum of Everyday Life and See that scissors? They had this big expo. Pull this back a little bit further. And so the, the expo there was looking at everyday items in different ways. And they had a scissors expo. And thousands of scissors and antique scissors and scissor sculpture. And I just got amazed at scissors, all the things you can do with scissors. And so I came back and um, I started thinking about, you know, how we repurpose in every day, and I'm going to be showing that quite a bit. And then I was thinking about, you know, don't we just love people um, who make stuff? So I thought that could be a really good cover of a book. Um, but no, so I love people who make stuff. And then I thought, hey, let's love stuff that people make. And then I had the scissors, and I'm going, no, that's not quite right. Okay, so we love stuff. And then um, I really want to make stuff that people love, right? I'd much rather make stuff that people would love, um, but then I, rather than making people love stuff, right? That doesn't make sense, right? But then what could I do? I could always just make love and stuff people, right? <laughs> okay? Um, <laughs> or the new title of my book is Make Stuff and Love People, right? 
So it's about the joy, right? All those four words about people, about making stuff. So people say, well, what do you do? I just make stuff. Uh, okay, so what? For who? For people. And I just love it, right? And I remember um, Mother Teresa would say, it's not how hard you work that's important. It's how much love you put into what you do that's most important. And so I also want to talk about when you leave here, you're going to be inspired. You're going to look at things very, very differently. And I hope that you will also look at things upside down and inside out and backwards. And as you begin to build things, you're going to discover that 90% of the time, whatever you build, whatever you make the first time, is not going to work. It's going to fail. And that's OK. Because if I teach you a five-minute approach, five minutes, $5 or less, no power tools, no glue, right? We're going to use like specialty tapes. And if you screw up, you can say, oh, thank God. Thank God I only spent um, a nickel's worth of material, or I only used new material. Thank God I only spent five minutes on it. You would be more inclined to try it again, try another way, try another way, keep doing it, keep doing it. And so you're going to see this journey on how do some solutions really develop and how do they emerge. It's very rare the first thing I come up with is the ultimate perfect solution. So same thing with you guys. Now, I'm obsessed with corrugated plastic, election signs. Oh, it's going to be a bumper crop coming up 2020. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to get tons and tons of election signs donated. And one of the cool things about election signs was at the last election, 2016, there was um, these. So New Hampshire is number first in the primaries. Everybody descends, ABC, CNN, CBS, they all descend on New Hampshire on primary day. And so I said to my students, I said, you know what? Today's a good day to cut up all these election signs, right? But they were 2012 election signs. I wasn't cutting. It's illegal to cut up people's election sign before an election. I don't think, I don't know. You shouldn't do that. All I know is that. All right. So, <laughs> so the media heard that I was cutting up all these election signs. So what they did was they asked to come into my classroom to see what were we making with all these discarded election signs. I lean my iPad. So then, this was picked up on 288 stations um, around the US. And um, 
all of a sudden, my phone was ringing. People wanted to donate corrugated plastic. Now, you would think that all my corrugated plastic is election signs. In fact, only 50%. Because corrugated plastic pops up like mattress sales or the Easter egg drop thing or real estate signs or um, vote yes on the new school. And so people were donating. But the greatest donation came from the Boston Zoo. Because the zoo gets hay from Wisconsin. And Wisconsin puts it on these incredibly awesome sheets of corrugated plastic that is really quite heavy duty. And it gets shipped out to Boston, and it goes to the giraffe barn. And then when, the, when um, they're done feeding the giraffes, and they get down to the sheet of corrugated plastic, they toss them out. And they're like, oh my gosh, you could really use this corrugated plastic. And so it's really nice and heavy duty. And I'd like to know where Wisconsin is getting the wicked strong corrugated plastic. So we'll have to find who the supplier is. Um, so I find Uline is another place that has the, the strong one. The stuff that you'll be using today is called 4 mil, and that's your typical election sign. That's the most common uh, material that you're going to find. And then I cover this in foamy because it grips onto my pants. And could I borrow this chair, please? So what's cool here is this becomes my lapeline because I can put it on my lap and now I can put my computer on. Or there is ladies in the sewing group. They go to the sewing clubs and stuff and they want to do sewing, but the thing keeps sliding off their laps. And so therefore, they love this because it's nice and portable, fits in you know backpack or under your arm, easy to carry, and lightweight. Well then, what happened was were you there when there was the White House aide who came? OK. And remember, we gave her the um, Obama lean, right? And I said, could you give this to um, President Obama? And I remember she looked at me, and she goes, you're the crazy lady who's cutting up all those election signs, because Associated Press did an article. And I'm like, yeah. So two months after that, I get a letter from the White House. With the, with the seal, the White House seal and everything. And it's from President Obama. And he said, um, thank you for the Obama lean. He said in Chicago, they did a lot of repurposing. And I didn't know he was a maker. But it was a really awesome letter. And he signed it. So I made that book a lean for him, right, kind of thing. So I was like, wow. So I have it framed next to the Obama lean, right? So I'm like, this is so cool. Well. Two months after that, I get a call from the White House. President Obama would like you to come to the White House to be part of on the panel on technology and disability. It was one of his goals for the last 70 days of office. I'm like, wow. And then they said, but you have to go through, you have to be vetted, and we have to do a background check on you. And I'm like, oh, because I have three FBI incident reports for carrying all this stuff. <laughs> Because you're going to be working with Instamorph today that looks like little bag, dime bags of cocaine, right? <laughs> yep. And then PVC pipe paper clips looks like bomb making material. And yeah, so um, I was, they contacted the Wisconsin State Police. Um, remember the underwear bomber? Um, there was the underwear bomber that, I don't know, lit his pants on fire or something on the plane. Anyways. The world changed even more. They hired behavioralists to work at the airports the day after. And I was traveling to Wisconsin to teach a switch making workshop. Well, when you teach switch making, right, you have wires and batteries, you know, battery interrupters. And I have business cards and fold them in half and make business card switches and all of this stuff. So I'm doing both um, 9 volt batteries and AA batteries. Well, when you're transporting 9 volt batteries, you do not want 9-volt batteries touching each other or touching anything metal, right? So the best way to transport 9-volt batteries is put them together, put a piece of duct tape, and put them in your pair of socks, right? Because then they're not going to touch anything. So the Wisconsin State Police was being contacted by Homeland Security about 
do you know there's per this person coming to Wisconsin to teach a, a, a switch making workshop? It was just like awful. It was just an awful experience. Then they confiscated my business card switches and sent those to Washington. And they said, this is the same way that we teach people how to make improvised explosive devices. Who taught you that? And I go, it's mine. Open up my book. It's on this page. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm being invited to the White House, right? And I give them all the information, and I never hear anything back. And I'm supposed to be at the White House the day before the election and the day of the election. And my daughter said, Mom, where are you going to be on Election Day? And I said, well, calendar says I'm supposed to be at the White House. But I never heard back, because I probably didn't pass the background check. And I didn't tell anybody, because I didn't want to be embarrassed by saying, yeah, I was invited, but <laughs> they won't let me in. I never, you know, never passed the background check. So we laughed about it. The next day, the phone rings, and it's the White House saying, we are so sorry. You better get here. We're expecting you to be on stage tomorrow morning. And we were, and I'm like scrambling. And I'm not listening to anything with the news. I'm throwing all this stuff in my luggage. And I said, what about the background check? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Um, <laughs> so I get to the White House. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I am going to be shaking hands with the President of the United States. Is that going to be right? So I'm like, I can't wait. You know, I hear that he's tall. He looked tall on TV. You know, going, I'm thinking I'm going to be shaking hands with Obama. That is like wicked cool. So then I get up on stage, and to the right of me is somebody from AT&T. To the left of me is Amazon. We got Hewlett Packard, um, Apple, and somebody's talking about nanotechnology and the Amazon Echo and you know the advanced computer and IBM Watson and how it's going to help people with disabilities. And I'm like, uh, I got some duct tape. Uh, <laughs> and I showed this video that you all saw. And it was being broadcasted live throughout the US. And it was in that room, that hearing room, where like the president speaks. And I'm like, oh, I see that on TV. That's really cool. And I am keep looking out and going, when do I see Obama? When do I get to see Obama, right? No Obama, no Obama. So then what happens is I'm up on stage and my phone is vibrating. And in our family, if your phone vibrates three times in a row, it's a family emergency. You better pick up. So um, I get off stage after my presentation and, and I pull out my phone and I cannot believe what I see. It's a text message with a photograph. It's from my daughter. It's a picture of her and President Obama two blocks from my house. <laughs> And she said, Mom, I, I didn't want to burst your bubble, but uh, you know, it's a tight race. And Obama came to campaign for Hillary the day before the election at the Whittemore Center, two blocks from our house. And I'm like, wow. And she said, yeah, I stayed up all night so I could be the first one in row so I could get in there to shake his hand to get a picture of him. And I'm like, I'm at the White House, and she is with the president. <laughs> and she's like, Mom, I'll never forget this moment. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I won't forget it either. So um, so today, when we start talking about flipping things upside down, and I want to start off with just inspire you, getting the thoughts. I'm going to be asking you to think differently. Then we're going to do, we've got a total of like five projects. We might get in for a little bit more. And you're going to be making a bunch of different things um, this morning. Then after lunch, we're going to dive into making some more projects out of corrugated plastic. We're going to make stuff out of Instamorph. We're going to make stuff out of an industrial twist tie. And we're going to go really slow in the sense of any time you pull out a knife or something, I'm going to say, hold on. <laughs> Don't cut yourself. But we're using pretty safe tools, pretty safe materials. So. The first thing is, this is Morgan. Morgan has spina bifida. He's a mechanical engineering student. And Morgan said, I'm tired of having to carry my cup of coffee all the time. And he said, can't you come up with some way that I could carry, you know, because other people was trying uh, carrying his coffee for him. And I said, yeah, I could put like a, a little cup holder just right on top, right on your cane. And so we're using a material called Velcro One Wrap. And so your handout has, you know, uh, and and the the link. Um, I don't work for any of these companies, but I do do research on who's got the cheapest, right? Where can I get the best deal? So those are the links. But so it's hook on one side and loop on the other, 
And the cool thing about that is you can take tapered beverage containers, if it's wider on top, narrow on the bottom, as soon as it drops in, it locks into place. So it's really something very easy to make. So I started making a bunch of these for wheelchairs and walkers and crutches. Then I thought, hey, what about this, huh? What about you go to sporting events or whatever, or somebody that's had a stroke, right? And they've got their cane and they want to water plants out on their deck. They can't carry because this side's paralyzed. So the lady leans against and she pulls the water bottle and then waters her plants and then slides it, drops it back down in. So I made this little holder and that was the other thing that we found was, did you know that people in assisted living facilities, uh, primarily, if you look at the number of bladder infections, one of the biggest things is people not being able to drink water. And when you ask, well, why aren't you drinking water? And they're like, because I can't, it's too much effort. I can't get a cup from the kitchen to the recliner with the walker. So then I made this little holders to go onto the walker and for cup holders, right? And so that works, but sometimes people just use a cane. Or of having multiple ways of having ways to transport liquids. So this is really quite easy to make. And I was concerned about how well our internet connection is here today. Because if we do not have a good internet connection, then we have to resort to using a MiFi device. So evidently, we have slow internet. So I'm going to start that up. And I'm just going to describe this. So all it is is um, a material that you can, it's a double-faced loop material that goes around your waist and then has one wrap secured attached. So you figure out the size of your container, attach it, drop your beverage in, and you're ready to go. And you can slide it in and slide it out. So thinking, check this out, another way that you can carry your beverage using this graphic strap kit and one wrap strap and a couple of one wrap cable ties. So it's very, so it all is one, it's secured, so there's no way that the Velcro is going to pull away because it's, it's a loop. So it gives you a pretty simple idea just with a D-ring. Then I looked at, I'm going to show how all of you can get six-pack abs in five minutes or less. Right? Six-pack abs. There you go. Six-pack abs, right? <laughs> in five minutes or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is root beer, by the way. Going, geez, that fits underneath my coat really well. And TSA loves that, right? Coming in with those. Nine, yes. Oh, you go, girl. <laughs> there you go. Just two. <laughs> One in each, yeah. She told her mom it was root beer. That's right. There we go. All right. So thinking about this concept of looking at quick grip clamps. So I'm obsessed with quick grip clamps because they've got two levers, one that slides the jaw back and forth, and the other one that tightens it. And then I discovered, guess what? If I only had the use of one hand, I can adjust this. I can just use gravity, right? So I can put it right, clamp stuff, and then I squeeze, burp, 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 burp. going, wow, that's really cool. And then I started looking at, what if I put it this way? What if I put it this way? I, I mean, this was really used, like um, woodworkers use this to hold the wood and stuff together. So I started thinking about attaching that to a wheelchair, and then taking this lock line material to go right over the top, and then to be able to mount the iPad. And then, this is Instamorph, and I'll get into that in a little bit about how that keeps it, because if I just put lock line on here, it would rotate around. But now I've got something that is shaped right over the top that lock it into place. But I want you to notice is, is that 
we've got an upside down elbow. And that's really important because when you start working with this material, if you mount something up here, I'm going to put, there we go. If you mount something towards somebody, and guess what? If they hit it, it goes out of the way and it doesn't come back. And that's one of the big complaints is, yeah, this uh, doesn't work because somebody with a lot of tone. Now watch what happens if I go upside down with this elbow. Then what happens is you hit it, it bounces back. So if you just remember the question mark, then it'll be much, much more durable. So in this case, so this kid is using a ventilator. And so what I did was I was watching him. And they didn't allow him to have a wheelchair tray because the school only had one wheelchair tray. And they said, oh, it doesn't fit on his wheelchair. And I said, well, we could take some quick grip clamps and we can clamp this tray right down so we could do that. And then a track. And so this is the first time with him using it and interacting and um, being independent with the iPad. Now, this whole concept of cantilever, so you have something suspended in midair. This not only works for somebody with a physical disability, or the mom is always saying, this is great because he always starts throwing stuff, right? But also for individuals with vision impairments. Because if you put something on the table, things start scattering all around. And I'm just curious in the room. So how many of you are special educators? Do we have any special education people? How many of you are um, occupational therapists? Do we have any OTs? Okay. How many of you are speech and language pathologists? Any SLPs? Okay. Um, how many of you are assistive technology specialists? All right. Um, how many of you are voc rehab counselors? You awesome. I got a lot of work stuff. Cool. Um, what other group did I miss? Independent living. Woohoo! All right, independent living. All right, awesome. You know, my first job was at the program for independent living was at the University of Wisconsin Stout until they found out that the board of directors is really the board of regents and you have to have 51% with disabilities. So that had to move off of campus to a separate location. But what was cool about working at, um, now they're called Center for Independent Living, was about traveling throughout northern Wisconsin. I had a nine county area and going into the homes, making things, right? All sorts of things on the fly. All right, so I took off the iPad and then what I saw was that this little boy would grab a hold of this and, okay, teachers love that sound, right? <laughs> And I thought about all these children who are on a ventilator. Everybody walks around them like, you know, eggshells, right, type of thing. And they never get out of the chair. They never get belly time. And about how this child wanted to do something with his hands and watching it. So then I thought, oh, I could put a steering wheel on it, right? I could put an iPad. I could turn his wheelchair into a race car. And so there's a program called Magic Wheelchairs, right? That you decorate the chair, you build a structure, all of that. So I started playing around with different apps, giving him more control and things that he can grip onto and move it around. Autism. So I'll never forget this kid. So I come into the, the, this particular school and they said, um, this student, what he does all day is he walks around the classroom. He will not sit down in a chair. We want him to sit down. We want him to sit down and work at the table. He refuses to sit down. And if he does sit down, he'll never, ever slide his chair on the table to do any work. So they told me I had to mount everything up at this height. So I took iPads and book holders, and I had everything at this height, just like they told me to do. So he comes into the classroom, and what does he do? Wham! Wham! <laughs> knocks, knocks it all down. And I thought about, again, in Salem, and I thought about that grade school, and I thought about one of the things my teacher did 
my third grade teacher to help me was she saw my hands always under the table and trying to control my hands and that anxiety. And she put a satin ribbon under from like Joanne Fabrics. And now I took, you know how like um, you're blanky when you were a little kid and having that above your lip, right? And your finger, whatever. And so I would do this. I'd go back and forth, right, with the satin. And that just was so calming. That was like really, really helpful. And I thought about whatever the reason is, is that this young man is really scared about the edge of the table and going to the. So I thought, you know, if I do this whole cantilever approach, it will bring it out to him. Right? So that he never has to slide his chair underneath the table. And so this is his first time interacting with an iPad. And he likes piano music. So he became engaged in so many wicked cool activities um, just by cantilevering and bringing stuff to him versus forcing him to um, adapt to the technology. Then this little girl, again, bringing this out, and she uses touch chat and for communicating on the fly. And what I like about this is that a lot of the tabletop systems that are out there are about 1000 bucks for communication. And here, we've got something for less than $20 to support. And she's using touch chat um, app. This is a college student um, at another university who's out of ventilator. And um, she's using, oh, oh wow. <laughs> I accidentally went, whoo, there we go. All right, for that, OK. Now, plates. I became obsessed with microwavable plates, all right? Because microwavable plates are round. And I'm like, wow. Shoot, I had the other iPad. Let's see there. Huh. Ah, there it is. Thank you. So if I take one of the things that we all have in common is our body weight. And with our body weight, what we can quickly do is I can take the lock line pieces snap them together, and then on the bottom of this plate, I'm going to snap this on the bottom of the plate. And now what I have is a very simple mounting solution. Because these microwavable plates bend, they're not a hard plate, I have created a very simple iPad mount. And my thighs, the weight of my body, holds it up. So I can interact with my iPad that way. So just by sitting on it. So that becomes just something really simple. So I start looking at other things that I can do with microwavable plates. I became obsessed with flagpole brackets. Because flagpole brackets, you can bend them in all different positions. Um, they go click, click, click. And then I found a new thing that goes click, click, click in terms of changing the angles. Home Depot has now these adjustable angles that you can that lock into place that are really cool. But I had flagpole brackets, so I thought, you know, I could do some really cool things with a couple of plates. And so this is my sushi Susan. Yes. All right. So turning making lazy Susans. So this is a gentleman with Arthur Graposis and he wants to be able, I'll never forget, he said he wants, wanted to be able to eat sushi. And I'm thinking, sushi, right? You pick it up, right? How do you put sushi you know, in your mouth and with the chopsticks? And then I thought, oh, I could take corrugated plastic. Now, the plastic you're going to be working with, it's Carly Fiorini's election signs. You know, she dropped out of the race really early. So I called them up and I said, you know, I'm really sorry about your candidate, but uh, can I have all the signs? <laughs> And they said, no, no, can't have it. I was like, oh. They said she might run for president again. So this was the last you know, election. 
So last year I get a call from her old campaign said, we have a semi-tractor trailer load of her signs. Do you want them? I said, absolutely, right? Do you know how many signs fits in a semi-tractor trailer? <laughs> yeah, and when it shows up on campus, they're like ready to kill me. So I have it stuffed in every attic, every tunnel, every basement with signs, do not throw away, save for Dr. Wilkham, because she does all this, this stuff with it. So I discovered that I could easily put the forks, slide the forks in there, and then I take this lock line material and make this particular Lazy Susan. And I also discovered that when I turned the plate upside down, it created a suction cup. So here we have two upside down plates, right? And then the, the forks, the spoon slide in there, okay? All right, that's cool. But then last year, fourth graders are wicked smart and four-year-olds, four-year-olds know everything. They start using words like actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the way they see the world is wonderful. So I was teaching a tech camp, and these little girls said, yeah, but what if he wants to eat soup? How is he going to eat soup? <laughs> so I asked um, Tony. I said, uh, Tony, do you ever want to eat soup? Yeah, but I don't know how you're going to come up with soup, OK? So I show you my soupy Susan, right? So taking this, um, a quicker clamp, a couple of those, evidently, they call them jello shot things. All right, so now we're going to flip it. Now we have a sushi Susan. All right, so then I want to show you. Ah, question. Oh, question, yes. This. So this is called centerboard. So I was on the sign making shop, and I want you to write this down. Good tip of the day earlmitch.com, and it's on your handouts when you scan it, but here's what the thing is, is earlmitch.com, they're out of Woodville, Illinois, and I get really great deals on buying corrugated plastic, like, like let's say you don't like signs, and you want it in yellow and green and blue, you can buy it in any color you want, and it's only like a buck or two bucks a board, right? It's really cool. Well. They also sell Centraboard, S-I-N-T-R-A. Okay, Centraboard is a subset, uh, uh, no, a substrate. It's another type of sign making material. And they sell it in an eighth of an inch, and they sell it in a quarter of an inch. So the eighth of an inch, I can take a utility knife, and you can, this stuff cuts like butter. This is like really, really easy once you make your, your template. And I started making these other pieces. Um, with Sintra board too, because it's so easy to cut and work with. And so then figuring out where do I have to drill, you know, the hole or cut the hole so that these can just drop in. So you can make lots of versions of that. But remember the original Sushi Su the, the, yeah, the Sushi Susan. Remember two plates and some walk line. And these discs that Modular Host sells, they were charging me like 12 bucks a disc. Lock line is expensive. Lock line's going to run you 10 bucks a foot, which is less than $1,000 for a mount. So then I looked at how can I make stuff without having to use the expensive lock line? How can I make lazy Susans? What's another way of making a lazy Susan? So remember that video where um, I just took the quick grip clamp, right? This is a baby quick grip clamp. And twist ties. You know that twist tie stuff? Because I need something to take up the hole and I need something that then can rotate, right? Just twirl around. Then I came up with a new way. I wanted something portable that when he goes out to eat, right? That something easier because, check this out, I discovered that, look at this, the flutes. If I just make a little cut here with the flute, you can get just about any spoon. I can get long spoons, forks, etc., and put it together this way. And now, this is completely portable, can fit into your pocket. And we're going to be doing some other things with spoons. So then, now you're down to just these three pieces that you carry with you, right, for hands-free eating, that you don't have to worry about, okay, i got to get the plates together and I have to. 
So very, very simple. And then you take that off, and this goes on top, and then you bring your jello shot cups. All right. So yeah, so that's a better shot at it. And that, so this whole thing is I try to, I, we do time and motion studies. So my videos, it's like, can we do it? Can we make it in five minutes or less? That's that whole thing. Because if it takes too much time, people say, ah, oh, I don't have time for this. All right, here's another one with flagpole brackets. Of Black & Decker has a leaf blower and I'm looking at how do I mount these cordless leaf blowers and cordless vacuum cleaners on the front of a wheelchair. And so this one student I was working with, 16 years old, and a lot of kids with and without disabilities really struggle with getting work experience. You know, I was like, I, I start hiring these work study students to work in my lab, and none of them ever worked in high school. And so they don't know what it's like, like the expectations of you don't text and you're not allowed to listen to music while you're working and you're expected to be there at 8 a.m. and you know all of this. So I got this kid a job and he has no use of his arms or legs. And I said, it's a, gre it's, um, a landscaping company. And what they do is they have these commercial contracts. And so a guy wears um, this blower on the back, and he walks up and down after they mow the grass, and he blows the grass clippings right off of the sidewalk. So I said to this kid, I said, I got the perfect job for you. You're going to blow grass clippings. And I'm just going to put one of these Black & Decker um, on the uh, front of your wheelchair. So we'll come back to it. So we start off in front of my building, and he's using chin control because he's got a joystick with chin control, and he can move from side to side in the leaf blower. So he's got control over the leaf blower. And spinning. Oh, there we go. So pretty simple, easy to do. So then I looked at, on a wheelchair, could we add a little tray on the wheelchair? And I was amazed at how many people really wanted something just on the side of their wheelchair that they could put their cup of coffee on, right? Or they could put a notebook on if they were taking notes. Something that would slide on and slide off. So what I'm using to attach here is, this is what is called a tubular fastener from Modular Hose. So I'm looking at that. This is $65 for that tubular fastener. And it works with PVC pipe, and it works, it, they have these other inserts. So I'm going to be showing you other ways of attaching things very quickly onto, onto the wheelchair. But so there you have it. You've got your little cup on there. Oh, and then the other thing was this non-slip material that you can get in a variety of different places. You can peel and stick it or cut it. I'll, I'll use um, this lock lift rug ripper tape that I'll get into a little bit further to attach so that you've got something to grip onto, or I could even use foamy on it, but looking at creative ways of, of non-slip material. All right, I can also take those flagpole brackets, take two of them, take them apart and join them in the center, and now I can adjust that, and so now I have a very simple fishing pole holder for that. Then this student happens to be, uh, so, so actually she graduated from high school, she said she wants to be a surgeon, and she has cerebral palsy, and she's also deaf. And so her father said, yes, she's just very unrealistic. She wants to be a surgeon, and you know, she doesn't, and, and the whole thing with communication. I said, well, what is she doing now? And he said, well, she uh, goes around the developmental disability services. She rides in the van, and they go around, they pick up aluminum cans, and they take it to this drop-off center. And I said, yeah, but she just communicated she wants to be a surgeon. And so she, he says, that's just not realistic. She'll never be a surgeon. And I was like, wow, you know, looking at disability versus ability. And she's very proficient with her communication in terms of typing, all of that, incredibly smart. There's no reason why she couldn't enter a field, medical field. And so we started looking at, we, this is an app that's called AAC Flip Writer. And what it does is, See how the screen is split in half? 
And you know the iPad's got a virtual microphone in there, right? So when she sees people's lips moving, she taps on that microphone and it types it on both sides so you can see what she's seeing that it's typing. So then you're like, no, 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 I didn't say that. Because Siri, of course, is not perfect, right? Sometimes it types up inappropriate things. Um, so able to have this dialogue back and forth. I'm gonna have to see if we can go with a higher speed. Now we only got one bar on here. All right, so here she's typing, but now you can see she's sitting on that plastic plate with the flagpole bracket that's holding it up. She did have that $1,000 mounting thing with a Dynavox. She's much faster communicating this way with Diana. So over here, Diana starts to ask her, you know, what do you like to do with your friends? And anyways, you'll have to trust me, it types it out. Whatever she says, yeah, types out. So this buffering is going to be a challenge today. We'll try it break time. So same one with this. But also looking at all the different ways we can mount um, an iPad to uh, PVC pipe, and I'm just using the lock line parts to give me flexibility at the end, and then the rest, everything's out of PVC. I'm making little walkers and mounting the iPad that way. Um, here is putting the cup holder right onto the side of the wheelchair and not letting it interfere. And again, we're using Velcro brand one wrap, but this time, instead of figuring out the diameter, because we drink from many types of beverages. So if we find one of the things like at Walgreens, uh, a wider base that's you know tapered, that's plastic, you drop that in there, then you can put your water bottle, you can put a cup in there, you can put whatever you want in there. Did you guys have this problem yesterday? So she's showing how it doesn't interfere with her controls. So that's a Dunkin' Donut cup. Yeah. So just something very, very simple. Now, how do you hold pages open if you only have the use of one hand? So now we have, this is the Lapaline board. And so the Lapaline board is just resting on her lap. And because she only has the use of one hand, she needs something for the left side to hold the pages. So today you're going to be making a spring clip, and that spring clip is attached to the side. And then what happens is when she turns the page, you're going to see how it just slides in underneath the spring clip. See, it just slides right underneath and holds it. Something very, very simple. There's like 50 things you can do with a spring clip. Um, these spring clips I also use to make um, sandwich holders. It started off with the sandwich holder. And Not cut deep enough, let's see. There we go. While that's spinning. Hey, I want to show you my really cool, sporty related little attachment to my AT pad stand that enables people to be able to keep themselves without any knives or things. So we can put this up high here. And as I'm eating it, I'm just gradually pulling it towards me, and it slides 
So then I thought, how about a virtual personal care assistant? Right? Right? So you're holding the sandwich, right? And with the lock line, you can position it, and you got the cup holder, and then you've got an iPad, and you can have conversations. Eating is a very social event type of thing. So the idea is having these, you can put multiple arms and position it all around the person to make it easier for them to reach and to grab. And because it's been, you know, oh, the other thing is that the sandwich thing comes off, the sandwich holder comes off, and then what pops on is a tray for pizza. Because pizza can be messy, and how does it secure the pizza, and how do you eat pizza hands-free? And then um, for carrots and celery, and then, that's not all, ice cream cones. How do you eat an ice cream cone independently? So I have a little tapered thing that the cone drops into, and that you can lick the cone, move it around, lick the cone. Wicked fun. I say wicked a lot. What? So um, do you see that? All that is is that's this base, right? Right? And then onto that base, I'm using a product that is called um, Uglu. And Uglu was really funny because, um, yeah. So remember the gentleman earlier today said, oh, I hope you're not going to make us use discarded bubble gum. That would be like really gross. And I said, no, we're going to do boogers today. And so uh, again, I don't believe in glue. And I don't believe in nuts and bolts, right? So therefore, we use this product, and this product is called U-Glue. And U-Glue is incredibly strong. You can put it on any surface. And I discovered U-Glue at Home Depot, at, um, oh, let's see, Joanne Fabrics. So I can mount stuff to you know anybody's table. It's like really, really strong. That's how this is secured, right? But I want to show you what happens is the way we remove you glue is you pull it parallel to the surface. Then you've got these cool boogers, right? And these cool little boogers I use when, you know, I'm like putting things around the perimeter. I talk about how we can use corrugated plastic and we can put objects around, like maybe some, you're, you're trying to communicate, you can write around the perimeter or, um, you can put different objects up there, you know, like, you know, do you want to play with knives today? Or, you know, and so you look at where their eyes go. But that's what's great about keeping these discarded boogers because uh, they're tacky, they don't leave any residue behind. Just a, a very simple way of communicating. It's U-G-L-U-E-N, it's on your handout, and you can scan and go right to the site. So that's how um, it's all of the arms are attached with those discs. Yes? Yes. No, I put them on, I, I put them on my file cabinet, and the maintenance person comes in and says, he keeps removing them, saying, somebody's putting these disgusting boogers on your file cabinet. And I'm like, that's mine. Leave them alone. Because... So I do find that after about six months, the outside of it dries out, but then I can pull it apart and it's still sticky in the middle. Now, I can also, you know those discarded um, poly cassette boxes? I can stick them in there too because nothing sticks to polypropylene. And then that keeps it lasting longer. But wait, that's not all because <laughs> with you glue boogers, like, you know, these boogers are going to start losing their stickiness because every time your oils, your fingers, right? Guess what? You can wash them. So you take Dawn dishwashing soap and hot water, and you uh, throw them in that sink, right? And you and it, it it disintegrates the oils from your fingers, and then you let them dry for about 20 minutes. Good as new. You can use them over and over again. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> washing your boogers. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what this is is looking at coffee cups differently and looking at the lids on a coffee cup. Have you ever thought about those lids and thought about what you could do like if you turn those lids upside down? And what this one video is about is I get all these calls about people throwing dice. How do you throw dice if you don't have the ability to shake to throw dice? 
And, and if you put it in a cup, you have to then turn it. Well, then I looked at, I was having a cup of coffee, and I looked at the coffee cup mugs um, very differently. And look at the green wire. Do you know green wire goes inside the flutes? And green wire you can find at the hardware store. It's steel, it's vinyl coated steel wire. You can bend it, slide it into the flutes on top, slide it on the bottom. Now you got something that pivots. Well, then saying, geez, what else could we toss, right? <laughs> we, could, we could have a food fight, right? We could toss a ball. We could toss um, uh, PVC. <laughs> oh, well. You got the idea in terms of launching, right? OK. Well, then I looked at you realize you could put your cell phone in there. Yeah. And I'm thinking if we try, we might be able to mount this. Oh, we'll try over at the door to see if we can get. Um, so there we go. Remember the whip app? Dun, 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 dun. Now, kids with disabilities can use the whip app. And then I was told that's inappropriate. Shouldn't be teaching people how to whip. You're not supposed to whip each other. I'm like, oh, come on. Too many rules. So I have to tell you, yeah, so somebody in Wyoming, I was in Wyoming, and they gave me these slap koozies, right? You put them around your beer can. And I'm like, wow, look at that snap, snap, snap. Going, oh, oh. So if we tip it upside down, right, and bend it backwards, what do we get? Boing! <laughs> so Caitlin, Caitlin tells me all these stories. So I hired her in my lab. I ended up hiring 10 students with various disabilities, and I ended up making about 100 different adaptations for them. But Caitlin, because her arms stop here, she said in physical education, they were never allowed to throw a ball. She was never allowed to use a pair of scissors because her, she, her movement is just right about here. And so I said, oh, we'll get you to throw a ball. So um, I looked at, so if we zoom in on this, all this is is binder clips, a piece of acrylic. And because this, when you fold it, this is like a rubbery neoprene stuff. So it grips onto the PVC pipe. The black material is from Home Depot Corner Guard. It goes for wallpaper. It goes around your corners to keep the wallpaper. So I needed something for it to slide into that she could just push down on it, and it would launch, launch a ball. And that white disc is these little mini Frisbee thingies just to put the ping pong ball in. So then people say, well, can she then load it herself? So you can see she can be independent in loading it. So then we did a variety of things. We put little balls with Velcro on it. We had target practice, all the things that you can launch. Um, food, like what's the high, you know, Rice Krispie treats, marshmallows, all of the stuff of tossing. So that was something that was nice and fun. Now, why do you think I'd walk around with a cell phone on my head? Uh, yeah, those are GoPro, but GoPro cameras, yeah, that's not a cell phone, but a GoPro camera. Yeah. Something better than that. A live feed. So what happened was we saw all these children with complex medical needs and adults. There was a, a nurse who was a general, or yeah, a retired general from nurse, anyways, 
she's got Parkinson's and she's in this assistive living facility and she has a really hard time getting out. And so one of the problems was how do we create, how do we, you know, create virtual real-time live feed? So what we discovered, first of all, was that with FaceTime, as long as the other person had an iPad or an iPhone with FaceTime at their place, you could have um, real-time communication back and forth with FaceTime. So at this assistive living facility, uh, she had a modem and she had FaceTime and she had an iPad. And she wanted to see the nursing department because we have a brand new um, nursing department. And I said, well, yeah, we'll show it to you. Well, then I discovered is that the crown of your head is the most stable for filming. Because if you have something here, it goes, mink, 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 right? You don't want anything on your shirt but on the crown of your head. Plus, on the crown of your head, you can keep both hands on your bicycle. So we had this website called What Do You Want to Do Today? Do you want to make cupcakes, right? Do you want to go kayaking? Do you want to go bird watching? And then people with disabilities who could not get out of their home or out of the hospital would sign up for an adventure. So my daughter would volunteer, and there was this little boy at Children's Hospital who kept yelling at her that she was going too fast on the bicycle, or he would say, stop, Megan, stop, or turn right, go on this trail, or go on this mountain biking, and he'd go mountain biking with her. Um, so, yes? Oh, cool. Right. Right. Well, it turns out that these industrial twist ties and your um, bicycle helmets have vents in them. So these slide right up in, and because it's a foam rubber grippy, you can put your phone in there, tighten it down real secure, get it at the right angle that you want it in, and then take off. Except my college students started whining. I look stupid walking around with people ask me why am I walking around with my phone on top of my head? And I said, and you told them why, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Or they just stare. And I said, it's not about you. You should educate them that you're being paired up with somebody at the hospital or somebody that can't get out. So we got this one and then we're going to take a break. So it's about cutting up Velcro and alternative ways and about how sitting at the dining room table, having dinner, and looking at the chairs that everybody is sitting at around the dining room table and thinking, oh, I have got a brilliant way. And I just wish that we had a brilliant way to speed up the internet. So um, so what you see here is rather than cutting up Velcro with your hands, you're going to see I've got a paper cutter. But the coolest thing I want you to see is what did I do with all of those dining room chairs? Please. And these, you know, that's the thing is that these are very short video clips that are only... So we're going to try. <laughs> but my daughter always says, Mom, do you think someday we could have dinner at the dining room table? <laughs> I'm like, that's my work surface. Or the kitchen counter. You know, I've been coming up Velcro with my own fashion and for a long time. Inno9. And the spindles grip onto the pipe perfectly. And then in between the spindles. And then what I do to get four inches very quickly is I'll put slices to a grab here a little bit. I'll put one 
older or from that size, because my hair is older than it was in this particular uh, jar right here. And so when I just slide it through, And I still have 10 fingers, right? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, so, so it's about 10.30. Let's take about a 10-minute break.